So once upon a time, approximately 66 million years ago, the Earth experienced this. A major impact event that's sometimes referred to as KPG event, which is short for Cretaceous Paleogene Boundary, responsible for the third worst mass extinction in the Earth's history, basically killing 75% of all plant and animal species, including of course our friends dinosaurs. And although when it comes to this event there's always been a lot of controversy and a lot of speculation about what exactly happened, or I guess what exactly caused the extinction, because we know that around this time there was also a major volcanic eruption in the present day India, today all researchers pretty much unanimously agree that the impact did happen and it potentially served as a kind of a final step that sealed the deal for a lot of different species, essentially causing a major ecological shift that lasted for at least a few hundred thousand years. And while in the last few years we've actually discussed some of the biggest studies that you can actually learn about in some of the videos in the description, but in essence more and more discoveries have been made in just the last five years, mostly because of the advances in modern sciences, but also because of discoveries from really cool locations, such as the now famous Tennis site, that's been heavily studied by a lot of different paleontologists, and represents an unusual detailed record with a lot of different species basically buried all at the same time just a few minutes after the impact. Now we'll actually discuss some of the major discoveries from this site in one of the future videos because there have been some updates, but as I mentioned you can actually learn about some of the previous discoveries in one of the latest videos somewhere in the description. Actually one of the most intriguing discoveries in just the last two years was the official identification of the approximate time when this event very likely occurred. Today we know it was approximately 66.043 million years ago, but most importantly many fossils from this region, especially fossils of various fish, indicate that it very likely happened sometime during spring or very early summer. So basically here we're talking about April or May. And that's because a lot of fish examined here seem to have died during its growth phase that usually happens in the spring and summer. And so in just the last five years researchers were able to recreate the timeline super accurately, mostly using a lot of radiometric dating, looking at various fossils of for example pollen and various seeds, and even finding certain unusual particles inside gills of these fossilized fish, which by itself meant that they must have breathed in and consumed a lot of the particles from this particular rock and then got buried inside the sediment. And another somewhat interesting study from just like a month ago even used a genetic analysis of modern bird species to basically work out how birds suddenly exploded in diversity right after this event, with all of this basically being traced to some of the initial bird survivors, eventually filling every major niche previously taken by the dinosaurs, which basically means there are just so many different topics to explore and we'll definitely do this in one of the videos coming in the next few weeks. But for now I actually wanted to focus on one of the most recent studies that finally worked out what kind of a rock this was and what this actually means both for the future of planet Earth and I guess for us in predicting next such event. And so in this video we're going to be focusing on this study that investigates isotopes of ruthenium, pretty much confirming the exact type of this asteroid and where it most likely came from. And unlike previous assumptions that suggested that maybe this was a comet and maybe it came from a really far away distance, possibly somewhere in the Oort cloud or at the least the Kuiper belt, this study almost definitively establishes that that's not the case. It was certainly an asteroid and it was actually a very specific type of an asteroid that we know quite a lot about and we even have some of them relatively close to planet Earth. And the way this was figured out was by essentially collecting various samples from certain regions around the planet where we know we have these layers that were created by various impacts. For example here's that typical layer that we know formed 66 million years ago. And inside of this layer there are quite a lot of unusual deposits a lot of platinum and a lot of ruthenium, elements that should not be present there in such amounts. But in this case they focused on several such locations from five other impacts that happened between 36 million and 470 million years ago, including an ancient three and a half billion year old layer containing various impact spherules. And the reason they collected so many was to basically see the differences in isotopes and then compare them to known asteroids that have been discovered on the planet over the years. And so here by using a completely new technique that analyzed element ruthenium, the scientists behind the study were able to work out the overall ratio 
that seem to align with certain types of asteroids. And while strangely enough, the dinosaur-killing asteroid was very different from a lot of other asteroids, but very similar to a type of an asteroid that we usually refer to as C-type, with C in this case meaning carbonaceous or basically asteroids containing a lot of carbon, whereas all of the other impacts seem to be caused by the S-type or silicate asteroids. And that by itself was maybe just a little bit unusual. And unusual because of the way we believe these asteroids most likely formed. And so first I guess let's talk about C-type asteroids compared to everything else. In general here it just refers to what we see on the surface and to some extent their composition. C-type asteroids seem to be very low in density and actually seem to have a composition much more similar to the Sun compared to other asteroids. But they also lack a lot of elements. They don't have a lot of hydrogen, helium or even a lot of other volatiles. Yet they do have a lot of carbon. And for the most part we usually find them on the outskirts of the main asteroid belt and much farther away from the Sun basically past Jupiter. And that's because to form these asteroids they had to have much colder conditions and basically be much farther from the Sun. And mostly because they do contain a lot of different volatiles or essentially a lot of ices. But unlike a lot of comets and even unlike S-type asteroids they're also super dark. In more scientific terms they have a very low albedo. And that seems to be caused by the high amount of carbon on the surface. Actually as a result they're much more difficult to detect and you're even unlikely to see them with a typical telescope. Nevertheless, surprisingly, of all of the asteroids out there, they do seem to be the most common. And so even though most meteorites landing on Earth seem to be S-type, in the rest of the solar system quite a lot of asteroids are C-type. For example, in the outer asteroid belt 80% are C-type, with the proportion increasing as you go farther and farther from the Sun. But as I mentioned, because they're so dark, they're also kind of difficult to find. Here's actually the largest known to us, the asteroid known as Hygieia. This one is over 400 kilometers in size. And so what the study definitively establishes is that this collision was extremely likely a C-type asteroid as well. And really just based on the isotopes of ruthenium, which would be extremely difficult to explain if it was a comet or if it was an S-type asteroid. Which as I mentioned before is usually the most common. But I guess the question is, Ok, but why is this important? Well, there are two possible reasons. First reason is in regards to water on Earth and the second reason is in regards to how likely is this to happen again. So first, water. Today we actually still have no idea where all of the water on Earth came from. Some studies suggested it was from asteroids or possibly comets, but so far none of the water from various asteroids matched the water we have on Earth. But here the C-type asteroids might potentially give us some clues. And so asteroids like this one, Hygieia, would actually contain enough water and potentially the right kind of water where a single collision from such an asteroid would be enough to form all oceans on the planet. And since we now know that at least one such collision happened 66 million years ago, this provides us with just a little bit more evidence pointing at the potential source and the potential origin of water on Earth. But the much more important reason is of course in trying to figure out how likely are these asteroids to strike the planet again? And turns out that the chances are not actually that low. Or I guess in other words, there are a few rocks out there that to some extent do resemble this asteroid quite a lot. And well, let's I guess discuss this briefly as well. Today we know of at least 2300 different potentially hazardous asteroids in the vicinity of planet Earth. And at least 150 so far have been discovered to be over 1 kilometer in size. Obviously, all of these 150 asteroids would be large enough to cause a major disaster on the planet. Here are some of these asteroids in descending order from the largest to the smallest. But intriguingly enough, the largest one discovered so far seems to be this, 9099 JM8. An asteroid approximately 7 kilometers across that orbits the Sun every 4 years. And though at its closest approach it actually comes really close to the orbit of planet Earth, at its farthest, it goes way beyond the asteroid belt, almost reaching Jupiter. But more interestingly, because it's so dark and so difficult to see, based on its very low albedo of just 0.03, it's extremely likely to be a C-type asteroid as well. In other words, the largest potentially hazardous asteroid is sort of like the miniature cousin of the asteroid that killed the dinosaurs. 
with the original impactor being approximately 10 kilometers, or I guess just a little bit larger. And so in that sense, this actually suggests that these types of collisions are possibly not as unlikely as we thought. Now, obviously, none of this is going to be happening in our lifetimes, but just the fact that the largest potentially dangerous asteroid seems to be extremely similar to the one that killed the dinosaurs is kind of bizarre. Although I guess here the question would be, is there any chance that maybe they're related? Or is it possible that both of them came from some kind of a larger collision, maybe millions of years ago? And is it possible that both of them are just remnants of a much larger rock? Now, we're not going to know any of this until someone actually goes and collects samples from this asteroid, but it's something to think about. And obviously, this is not the only such rock on a very similar orbit, and so there is maybe a chance that at least some of these rocks represent remnants of an ancient collision that possibly created this impactor, and left a few other pieces in the same orbit. But that's at least based on recent studies. Now we'll definitely come back and talk more about this in some of the future videos, especially on the actual effects of the impact, but that's not coming out for another few weeks. And so until then, check out the previous video on the day the dinosaurs died and all of the incredible discoveries about this day that's been made in the last few years. All of those videos should be in the description. And so on that note, until future studies and until future discoveries, thank you for watching, subscribe, Share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences. Come back tomorrow to learn something else. Support this channel on Patreon by joining general membership or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye-bye.